Hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast. With your host, Kenneth Bacor. With my special guest, Alexi Heff from Owning a Tesla in the City. This is Episode 7, recorded via WebEx on November 9th, 2018. All right, well, here we are with Episode 7 already of the EV Revolution Audio Podcast. My, my, how time flies. We're getting close to the holiday season, and I'm just cranking these episodes out. And I'm very excited, and I'm stoked to have a special guest with me today, all the way from Washington, D.C., Man, did you ever have a week down there? I'll tell you. <laughs> <For> <laughs> yeah. Canadians watching what's going on. I have Miss Alexi Hoft. Did I pronounce that right? I should have asked you how I pronounced your last name. It's not a very phonetic last name. Right. So we pronounce it Heft, but probably Heft. originally okay. it was something like Hoft. That's kind of what I was leading towards. It's it's Dutch or Germanic or something. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 that area, yeah. Okay, well, gee, I'm not doing too bad there for an older guy. Well, welcome very much. Uh, thank you very much for joining me on the show. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much, Ken. I'm really excited. Yeah, virtually. You know, we're, what, uh, 2,000 miles apart or something like that? I don't know, 1,200 miles? About 1,000, yeah. 1,000, there we go. Well, listen, uh, I know that we had chatted over Twitter over the last few months to try to sync up, and uh, and I appreciate you, appreciate you reaching out to me. Uh, to chat, um, I think that you, you have a unique story that I kind of wanted to bring to listeners uh, on this episode where, um, you know, a lot of people are thinking of EVs and a lot of people struggle because they either live in condos or they don't, they live in areas where maybe infrastructure doesn't exist, but, you know, they want to go to a zero emission state as much as they can. So I think your story is um, fairly exciting and unique from that perspective. Um, and certainly want to explore that with you on today's podcast and understand your story, your EV origin, as you, uh, as we can talk about. Uh, obviously, you have a Model 3, how you like the Model 3. And I already know because you've been smiling since we started talking about this. So obviously, that gives, uh, gives everything away. Um, and then, you know, some of the challenges you may face from an EV infrastructure. I'm not familiar with the Washington, D.C. area from what's there. Um, from a state and from a municipal level for infrastructure. So it'd be interesting to get your take on that and your experiences. And then I know we had a couple of questions come in that we'll, we'll address and we'll talk a little bit about news. So um, so that's is that okay with you from an itinerary perspective? I'm ready. Sounds great. Now you, um, uh, off the top for our, our listeners, you are a math major. You actually do an online calculus tutoring. Is that correct, business? Exactly, exactly. Wow. I do one on one awesome. math tutoring, and oh, yeah. occasionally it's in person if they're within two or three miles of me, but oh. everything else is virtual like this. And yeah. you can get so much done these days writing math formulas on the screen. It's pretty interactive. You can. Now, let's get the plug out of the way right away. What's the, the web address for your calculus uh, tutoring? Let's uh, shout that out there. Uh, I'm I need to pass calculus.com. That's pretty easy. All right. <laughs> so folks, if you know, if you have any kids or if you're a student taking calculus or you're just maybe somebody older like me that wants to melt your brain, then uh, sign up for uh, I just want to pass calculus.com. Is that correct? Did I, get that right? I need to pass calculus.com. I need to pass calculus. Most people want to pass calculus. Most people <laughs> need to pass calculus. There you go. I understand the difference. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, so listen, so tell me a little bit about your EV origin story. Now, the Model 3 is your first electric car. Is that correct? It is. I had an old Honda Accord before that, mm -hmm. and that was my only other car. Okay. And I have to give credit to my aunt and uncle from the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. They live in Olympia, Washington. Beautiful and, area. I've been there a few times. I love it. Yes. Yeah. And it's another Tesla hotspot. Yes. Big time. And I think it was summer 2011. They were really interested in pre-ordering a Model S. Mm -hmm. And we went to the downtown Seattle location, and they had a Roadster in the showroom. Wow. We sat in the Roadster. We learned all about the battery cells. And sight on scene, they put down a deposit for the Model S, and a year and a half later took delivery. Excellent. So that goes back, what, about three years or so, I guess? Uh, I guess seven yeah, now. Seven already. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. 
So they yeah, were one of the pioneers in getting into it. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So many people were concerned for them. You know, this, I've heard so many news stories about this company. Are you sure you're not going to lose your deposit? Mm -hmm. And it was pretty risky way back then before the Model S, uh, but they got their Model S. They're in love with it. They still own it. Very little battery degradation. And they love it so much. They both always wanted to drive it. And more recently, they replaced their second vehicle with another Model S. There you go. Excellent. And that's typically what we find with EV ownership. Uh, again, I'm, I'm new to it as you are, but from people that I talk to that already have an existing EV, be it a Tesla, Nissan or whatever, they typically will buy a second one, you know, and that first one will get, you know, handed down to a, a lesser use or to another family member or whatever as a secondary vehicle. And, and they'll, they'll upgrade their, their primary vehicle. Um, so that seems to happen a lot, and that says a lot for the EV industry, which is still young, that these cars are competitive and, and are practical. Absolutely, absolutely. So you were, so you've got, you, you got incented a little bit by your family members and, and understanding their experiences in uh, all electric transportation. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, you had an old Honda Accord. Now, we talked about this just before I pressed the record button for the show of the different generations of some of the different perspectives and ideas. And I talk to a lot of folks that are a little bit younger than my age, but maybe not a whole lot younger, like yourself being a millennial. What, you know, obviously um, you're, you're, uh, you're growing up is much more aware of, of the environment, of surroundings. You're, we're a much more connected world than, than in my generation, as an example. So did that have any influence on your choice to start looking to EV uh, in addition to your family uh, experiences? I do think so. I got another family experience with my dad pre-ordering the Model X. Uh -huh. And then once you get this little germ of, of an idea in your head, you it's like a chain reaction and you want more and more parts of your life to match up. Uh -huh. And so I was really interested in getting an electric car myself. And then since then, also, it's impacted other areas, like I recycle more often with the things that are harder to recycle. It's really great how it's this cascading effect. I do think reading the newspaper and talking to friends about all these sustainability issues, I think that also helped a lot. And that's a great point you make. It certainly does create a, a greater awareness when you when you start thinking about electric vehicles. You know, be it be it full battery only or plug in hybrid, as a, I kind of lump the two in together all the time. It does give you that awareness of you know if I'm going to get an EV for these reasons, I should probably look at some of the other things I can do to help from an environmental and health aspect, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. It goes from recycling to eating healthier to exercise and everything in between as, as how we look at the world. Absolutely. Exactly. So so you had this Honda Accord and I take it, was it uh, on its last legs and you needed to get another car? Because you, uh, your uh, DC gets not as cold as the climate as up here in Toronto area where I am, but you do get snow. You do get some some uh, seasons, right? You get the four seasons come and go. Um, so how did, how did all that 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 idea that germinated, how did it kind of get into a reservation, I guess, for a Model 3? Yeah, so I waited as long as possible in my life to own a car. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a college student, it's hard to afford one. Mm -hmm. I waited until I was about 26 years old, and I mm -hmm. finally got a car. Uh, this Honda Accord had over 100,000 miles at the time. Yeah. And with a really old used car, you don't have to pay that much for operation of the vehicle compared to a new car's depreciation, mm -hmm. but still you have to replace everything gradually. And you always think, okay, I did the timing belt. Now I probably get a break or, oh, I just rebuilt the entire transmission. I probably get a break now, but you never really get a break <laughs> from surfacing. That's true. It's still a pretty economical car, but you're constantly replacing things. So it was on its last legs in that sense that everything was due for replacement gradually, and I just had to prioritize what was I going to replace first. Uh, luckily, it never broke down with me, so that was good. Um, but then, uh, yeah, March 31st, I stood in line, 2016, and wow. got my reservation, and... Sure. Uh, got that car, the Honda Accord, to last all the way through to May 4th, 2018, when I took delivery. Excellent. And it's interesting that you stood in line at one of the Tesla stores 
Um, and this is a sight on scene uh, a crowd, you know, when the, the, before the reveal, correct? Before the reveal, exactly. Right. That night, I was really excited for the show to see the reveal, mm -hmm. but I knew I wanted this car. Yeah. And of course, if it turned out the car was not at all what I, I was expecting, then I could just get my deposit back. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty sure, based on all the leaked details, that it was exactly up my alley, and I'd have an extra two and a half years to save up for the car, mm -hmm. and it just seemed to make sense for me. Mm -hmm. Now, at that time in, in, in um, March of 2016, once you put your reservation and then the reveal came and you were, you were satisfied with what came out that Elon had announced, and you knew, you knew it was going to be a, a bit of a waiting game, but we all did, um, did you start thinking about, okay, once I get the car, where am I going to charge it? What kind of infrastructure is in place? Like, did you, did you buy the car first before looking at what's available, or did you kind of do some homework prior to that? So people are different. For me, I was so excited about the car and I so wanted it mm -hmm. that I was going to make it fit into my life. And yeah. for other people, the charging has to be more convenient for it to make mm -hmm. sense for them. Mm -hmm. So at the time when I stood in line, I was up in New Jersey at Rutgers finishing my math grad degree. And up there, there's a lot of parking. There's a lot of suburban areas. And it probably would have been fine up there, but I knew that's not where I was going to be probably when I took delivery. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I think I knew my life was going to change so much in the next two years that I didn't even worry about the exact details of charging. And then in the meanwhile, I moved down to D.C., you know, graduated, moved down to D.C. and got married. So a lot changed. Wow, you had quite the emotional ride on, on all kinds of different levels there. Exactly. Getting married, buying a car, sight unseen, all that stuff. Exactly, yeah. Well, that's, you know, and, you know, sometimes that's what we, just what we have to do as people. We just have to trust our, our judgment there and go for it. And uh, certainly it's worked out for you. Um, so you had some time to think of, to wait for your car. You started to, to get involved, I take it, on forums and, and websites and, and, clubs and this kind of stuff. Tell a little bit about that waiting experience up until the Model 3. Yeah, there are so many great uh, clubs and Facebook groups. And on Twitter, you can follow the hashtag Tesla hashtag mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get to know the types of people you want to follow. YouTube mm -hmm. channels that are just so much fun to follow with people, Teslas with different lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I listen to podcasts. And uh, I consumed the forums. So I think the forums are absolutely incredible when you have a very particular question, especially mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when there's not likely a YouTube video for it. Mm -hmm. But I do want to start participating more in forums. Mm -hmm. But that was really helpful for over two years waiting. I had this fantastic, energetic community to reach out to, to learn from, to watch them receive their cars, uh, learn more about the Model S and the Model X, and mm -hmm. and it really made the time pass faster. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, now, you uh, picked up your car in May of this year, um, and I believe, if I remember reading correctly, you named it Luna. Is that correct? Yeah, she's Luna. She's, she's my Luna. baby. I love it, her very it's, much. It's a white uh, Model 3, is that correct? Uh, it's the light silver. The light so the silver, silver okay. metallic that's, uh, I think, no longer even off menu. Is it fully discontinued? Right. It, it may be. I haven't looked at the uh, Design Studio site for quite some time. But I think the Obsidian Black, which was mm -hmm. the more expensive black, mm -hmm. and the Light Silver, the Metallic Silver, were the two least popular colors. So mm -hmm. I think those have been phased out. I believe so. So uh, you were kind of like me when I got my leaf. I decided to get the, uh, what they call, the, well, it's a greenish color. Anyway, people have seen pictures and videos of it. But one of the main reasons is because, A, I liked it. It was And it was different. It wasn't very popular. So just to be different, right? Be a bit more unique. Yeah, it was a little bit on the fence for the color. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a really nice uh, Twitter friend of mine invited me to uh, the unveiling of the semi-truck and the mm -hmm. Roadster in last okay. November. Yep. And while I was there, I saw the Model 3 in person for the first time. This was a year and a half after putting down my deposit. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited. And seeing the car in person really helped me choose my color. Right. I loved all the colors, but I was just 
obsessed with the light silver. I think I just love the clean look and very timeless. So mm -hmm. that really sealed the deal for me. So if you're not sure about the color, then just head over to the nearest showroom for Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I think looking at all the different cars and all the different colors can really help. Exactly. And buyers nowadays have that luxury of, of that, that there's some at least some show cars in showrooms that you could go sit in and try them. I don't know if they've started the, the, the driving programs yet uh, in some of the stores. I think it's very regional, but certainly, you, you know, sitting in it, looking at it, touching it, uh, smelling it, all that good stuff that we like to do uh, is now available for people and has been for the last few months that they can go and try. So it was it was great that you had the opportunity to see that as well, to uh, to cement in your choice of, of color and uh, keep you excited for delivery day. Yes, and I had to have my first sighting of the Model 3, which involved a lot of screaming and jumping. It was really fun. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people. Yeah, you know, it was interesting uh, when Trevor and I went down and, and uh, did our video review um, in, in uh, October before they started, just after production started. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a car that... Uh, that hit all the buttons and, um, uh, you know, again, seeing it in real life is much different than seeing it on the screen. So certainly encourage people who are thinking of, of a Tesla or any EV to go check out their dealers. And, and of course, you know, look at all the resources that are available. May uh, this year comes around, you go to pick up your car, you're super excited. You probably had to control your breathing so that you didn't pass. <laughs> you picked it up. How did that day go for you? Oh, it was a really fun day. Uh, another Tesla friend of mine picked me up in the city in his red Model 3 and drove me out to the service center where I was taking delivery. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really exciting day. Uh, the, the delivery itself, you know, you go through the paperwork and the boring parts and looking over the car. Luckily, there were no issues with my car. Mm -hmm. But really, it's the moment when the car is yours, you're done with your delivery appointment. And I haven't had a child, so I can't relate directly to the experience of the hospital pushing you out the door. Okay, go take care of this child now. But in a miniature way, I sort of felt like that, like this car was suddenly mine and I could drive anywhere in the world I wanted and just go start life. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent analogy. It, it very much is like that, that whole experience, especially when it's such a a, a, a different purchase. I mean, you know, EVs are still relatively new in the marketplace and, and it's a different mindset. And, and there's a little bit of unknown and uncertainty about that. Gee, did I really make the right decision? You know, I want to, want to, want to go EV for these reasons. And is it right? So uh, it's interesting that, that you felt that way. So how, how have uh, the last uh, six months been for you? They have been a great six months. Mm -hmm. I think an electric vehicle was really compatible with me. Mm -hmm. I'm a very sensitive person, so I don't like loud noises. Mm -hmm. I don't like strong fumes, things yeah. like that. So for me, it was a very easy transition. I was ready to be away from all that stuff. And also there are just all these little niceties like the pre-cooling and the preheating of the car Plus, I was skipping 18 years of car technology. So there are so many things that you can even find in the most economical 2018 model of a car mm -hmm. that I wasn't used to in my 2000 Honda Accord. Mm -hmm. So to combine the fact that it was a much fancier car than I was used to and much more modern, plus all of the little bonuses of Tesla Autopilot and all the fancy over-the-air updates that I've really enjoyed. Already getting all these new features. It's mm -hmm. just been so much fun. 7,300 miles. And, okay. and I had a door handle recently that was taking too long to go back flush with the mm -hmm. car body. Mm -hmm. But I had my first Tesla mobile service appointment this week. And it was so easy. You tell them what address the car is at and what time is convenient for you. And they drive their mobile service van out to meet you. And the vast majority of service complaints can be addressed without going to the service center. Yeah. It was the best experience. So if you're not familiar with doing the mobile service appointments, I'd recommend uh, when you make an appointment for service, mention that you want it to be a mobile service appointment. Mm -hmm. And if the car doesn't need to go on the lift, then they can fulfill that and a dispatcher will call you and make the appointment. So I highly recommend it for all Tesla owners. 
That's excellent. Yeah, I haven't really talked to uh, any owners yet that have had to deal with the mobile service type of experience. And, and it's uh, I'm not surprised that you have a very positive experience on that. Tesla is known for their outstanding uh, post-sale service and support and customer satisfaction. So it's uh, no surprise that they were able to deliver on that. And it's a great uh, offering that they have because, again, they don't have stores and centers all over the place. So they need to geographically expand that by deploying uh, the mobile service technicians. So I'm glad to hear that everything went well on that. Yeah, and a few other things, no matter how much you read up about Tesla ahead of time, once you actually have the car and experience it in person, you learn so much more. Mm -hmm. And supercharging, even though I understood how fast it was, to actually experience it in person on a road trip was incredible to have instantaneous charging speeds of about 450 miles per hour mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so there are people like my mother who like to drive six hour stretches without stopping or a five mm -hmm. minute break. And so there's a small segment of the population where supercharging still isn't fast enough. It would change mm -hmm. their road tripping style. Mm -hmm. But for someone like me who has a slightly more leisurely pace and every 200 miles, I like stopping for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It was effortless. Driving in my Honda for a road trip was exactly the same speed because mm -hmm. I like taking those little breaks. Mm -hmm. That's a great, uh, great points that you make. Uh, there are still the, the small number of people that want to just kind of get from A to B as fast as possible. Um, so sometimes, you know, long range trips in an EV will be a bit cumbersome depending on the model and, and what's available from a charging perspective. We are, uh, I have talked about this and we'll continue to see the industry move towards ultra fast charging and even beyond that speeds, you know, uh, Porsche is coming out with 350 kilowatt speed so you know getting to 80 percent in like 10 8 10 12 15 minutes something along that so that experience is coming and we'll need the technology to catch up but for the vast majority as you mentioned you, Kate, your use cases and and even my use cases that don't typically do a lot of long distance uh, uh traveling uh it's not really range anxiety anymore i, I use the term bladder anxiety because that's usually why i have to <laughs> stop you know i need to rest and stretch a leg and use the facilities and grab a co another coffee to keep going. So, you know, while you're doing that 20 minute, uh, half hour, 40 minute stop, whatever your, your car is getting refueled uh, with electrons. Right. Exactly. I love it. And Tesla actually spices things up with their superchargers because some of them have amenities in them. They're branching out. You know, some of them are, they try to strategically put them where they're, they're close to an amenity of some sort so that you can do something for half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever the case may be. I have had great experiences uh, at my superchargers. Mm -hmm. And for people who have a lot of flexibility in which superchargers they go to, which is not as much the case in Canada once you leave Toronto area, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in around DC, when I'm just taking a couple state road trip nearby, I have superchargers every 50 or 80 miles, so mm -hmm. I can choose which ones to skip. Mm -hmm. You can check out Google Maps and the reviews for each one, what amenities are nearby, and then you have the flexibility to skip the ones that you don't like as much and choose the ones that have your favorite restaurants nearby. Mm, interesting point. And Tesla makes it uh, very convenient through, obviously, the onboard maps and the, the routing that you can put in into the screen in the Model 3 for your nav to, again, pick those destinations, tell you how much uh, an estimated battery charge you'll have left when you get there and so forth, that whether you can make it or not. So it's a pretty pretty cool system. And most of the other uh, uh, all-electric manufacturers have something similar. Some is not, not as refined as Tesla, but they all give you similar information as far as being able to reach it and, and where charging centers are and so forth. So they definitely have a good experience. Now, I want to stay on that topic of charging. We had a question um, you, did a, you did a tweet earlier today and asked for some questions. And we have, I want to recognize uh, a Twitter handle. Uh, the name's Harry-Ken. And that's a good name, by the way, Ken. I want to throw that out there. Um, and it's a Twitter user at uh, Tajorde, if I got that right. And he, was, uh, he or she was asking about the charging. So you live in a condo and uh, you don't have a, a built-in charger in your uh, building. Is that correct? Correct. So okay. I live in actual Washington, D.C., uh -huh. and so very few parking lots and mm -hmm. yes. competitive street parking. 
yeah. it is very competitively like New York and, and, and the other uh, major metropolitan areas. So how in the heck now, obviously, you've got the long range Tesla Model 3. So that helps from, uh, you know, getting getting uh, uh, expanding your battery range. But how do you get by without a charger in your condo? It definitely helps having the bigger battery. So what I like to think about it as, I don't personally have a commute because I work from home for my business, but I have put on 7,300 miles in six months. So I'm right at the average mileage per year for an American. And what works for me is I do very little driving from one destination to another within the city because a lot of times there's a bus route or a subway route, or just a quick Uber ride that's more efficient. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of times when I'm using my car, it's to leave the city. And there are lots of superchargers all the way around my city in DC. And I have a bunch of friends and family out in the suburbs whom I'm usually visiting. Mm -hmm. And I can park and charge at their garages or at a nearby mall when I'm running errands. So I usually just clump together a whole bunch of errands, which again is kind of like that chain reaction, trying to be more efficient. Once mm -hmm. you start thinking about the sustainability lifestyle, I try to do five different errands all in one trip out to the suburbs. I can visit my grandfather and my parents and my little sister and my older sister and pick up something at Target and get a flu shot and supercharge. So I just cluster all those together and I could do an incredible amount of city driving without going out to the suburbs and without charging, especially because EVs are so efficient at 25 miles an hour and for mm -hmm. short distances. You, you know, it makes some excellent points. I mean, for, for folks that do live in urban areas where there is good transit um, and even, you know, the point about taking a short Uber, you're right. Rather than trying to drive and find a parking spot that's going to cost you 20 bucks, for a couple of hours to do what you have to do, um, you, it's probably cheaper to take a $6 Uber ride there and back and forth, much more convenient. So that's, that's a great uh, spin on that. And, you know, we all, uh, as EV owners, we, we love the friends and family plan that you talked about, uh, you know, going to where you could park for a while and utilize a, a friends or family plug, uh, whether they have a, you know, level two charger or just, you know, uh, the biggest question I get is, where can I charge it? And I said, well, do you see a 110 plug everywhere? Exactly. It's right in front of you. So where do you charge your phone? So utilizing those elements are great. Exactly. So right on my block, I have a Tesla friend, mm -hmm. uh, and he has a light silver Model X, and he actually has a commute within the city. So his commute is only single digit miles each way, maybe uh -huh. three or four miles each way. Wow. And he only uses a 110 outlet to charge his Model X every night at home. So mm -hmm. he does have home charging because his parking spot is right connected with the outside of his apartment. Mm -hmm. But his within the city driving is so minimal mm -hmm. that he can just use a standard wall outlet. And then when he, when he takes a trip out to the beach or whatever, there are a ton of superchargers along the way. And, you know, that adds up to extremely low cost charging uh, as far as dollars go. I mean, when you're doing yeah. these trickle charges, it, it costs, it's a very negligible cost uh, on top of your hydro bill, uh, if any, depending on, on the scenario that your friends, uh, your friend has. Uh, yeah, I have a relative as well. Same kind of deal. He's got a Nissan Leaf. He doesn't have a level two, doesn't have access. I mean, he can get access to a DC, but puts on 15, 20 K kilometers every couple of days. Uh, and when he's not going out, he's a, a older retired gentleman. And when he's not going out, it's, he's luckily that his condo has a 110 outlet near his park, parking spot. And he can plug his super says, yeah, go ahead and plug in. No problem. He plugs in. Gets wow. Free, that's free great. Charging, <laughs> and that's it's amazing. still charging. Yeah. So he's, he's loving it. He stopped paying for fuel now. So uh, it's definitely a building by building basis yes. case by case basis. And it's definitely worth having a friendly chat with your superintendent because you might mm -hmm. be surprised what they're willing to do. They might even be willing to, to uh, install a level two charger mm -hmm. because it's good for drawing in new tenants. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we've talked about this uh, in Ontario. They've, they've amended some of the, the condominium acts and stuff to put, to put uh, um incentives for condos to, to start looking at deploying uh, chargers. I'm sure they're doing something similar into the U.S. and various municipalities. 
Um, is your building, has your building picked up on that yet? Uh, are they looking to, to do something? I don't think so. And my specific case is a little complicated because my spot is against the wall of a building that's not my building. My building's right next to it. Uh -huh. So my building that I live in owns the parking spot, but not the wall of the building I'm next to. So it's mm. kind of complicated. Yeah. So my charging is so easy going out to the suburbs that I haven't even tried to communicate with both buildings and arrange something. Yeah, and that, it, it, you're absolutely right. It can get very complicated. Some of the condo, especially if they're older or existing buildings that have been around for a while, trying to retrofit can be very costly and legally be very complex as well. As you said, depending on your proximity to other buildings, if you're attached and and, and then codes and all this other stuff that come in. So it's uh, it's not a it's not as easy as just saying going to your super and, and putting in a level two. There's a lot more to it in a lot of cases for that. But you know, being aware of public infrastructure and I'm, uh, have you seen a growth in that not just from a Tesla perspective but from other types of chargers uh, level twos and and, uh, and and even other level three infrastructures going up I do think it has been exploding exponentially mm -hmm. I love following plug share mm -hmm. and what I especially love about plug share is when you open up the map and you see it dotted with all these chargers mm -hmm. you can see specifically the speed and whether other people have success charging there and also some of them have free parking and free charging. So whenever I go to Costco uh, outside of DC, there's free charging. That's also a very good parking spot in the garage. So you get free parking, free charging, and the best spot in the house. So there are certain places where you can actually get free parking and free charging within the city. Mm -hmm. So just uh, browsing for a while in your area on PlugShare can unearth a couple of gems. You know, that's another great point you make. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with IKEAs. They pretty well have standardized on, on DC Fast and Level 2 throughout most of their stores, if not all of them in North America, certainly here in Canada. Um, so yeah, right. You can run errands, go for a couple hours. Most malls, things like that as well, are picking up. In fact, sometimes I feel a little guilty for parking in this primo parking spot. Um, <laughs> once you get after the the uh, the accessible needs parking and the the mothers and infants or family parking, then you get <laughs> TV parking, and I kind of feel bad for parking there. But I'm going, ah, why not? You know, it's there. I might as well take it. So. Yeah, exactly. So, I think I've seen a couple uh, pop up recently that I think are called Volta, mm -hmm, and they yeah. have a big blue light, mm -hmm. and they have just excellent spots in front of a bunch of malls in my area. It's great. Nice. What's the So you mentioned that you did a road trip earlier. How long was that road trip? Uh, was it just kind of a, a one-day thing out and then uh, uh, on a trip, or was it a multi-day trip? I've done a few. Uh, let's see. So the very first weekend I had Luna, I drove up to upstate New York, where my grandfather used to live. He was about to move down. So it was my last chance to take a road trip up there in the Tesla instead of the Honda. Uh -huh. And I, I was such a nerd with my Honda that I would always stop at superchargers to just visit them and get to know them and uh -huh. see if there happened to be a Tesla owner there to chat with. But that was about 400 miles one way. Okay. And so for me, uh, when I would drive with my Honda, my wrists and arms would tend to get the most tired from all the tiny little motions to stay in the lane. Uh -huh. So I love autopilot for that. Uh -huh. And then as far as the supercharging cadence, that was effortless for me because it exactly matched what I'm used to for road trips. Excellent. So, uh, so nothing's really changed from a lifestyle and from an experience in driving. I mean, as far as, you know, the raw experience of driving goes, obviously we have tools and technologies and Tesla and other uh, cars, uh, even especially electric vehicles that are coming out that, that have these driving aids. So you really haven't had to adjust too much from that. In fact, if anything, it's made things easier for you, correct? I think it has made things less mm -hmm. tiring. I'm a very conservative autopilot user. Mm -hmm. I'm very fastidious, hand on the wheel kind of person. Mm -hmm. yep. And it still makes it a lot less tiring for me. I actually really enjoy driving. I love driving for sport. I don't have practice on a track or anything, mm -hmm. but I just really love driving as an actual activity. And so sometimes I just love driving manually and taking those on ramps and flooring it whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And I think I have to rotate my tires. My rear treads are definitely wearing down. And, uh, but 
let's see, for long road trips, I really like using autopilot. It definitely uh, keeps my arms from getting sore and just keeps me more mentally focused on the bigger picture, who's passing me, who seems to be not paying attention and things like that, where I can help out. Yeah, uh, excellent points. Um, those those driver's aids are, are remarkable in their sophistication. Some are obviously more sophisticated than others. Tesla has done a great job and they continue to improve. But even others like GM's and, and you know Nissan's ProPilot, as an example, is a very good tool. It's great for long distance. I agree with you. I've experienced that myself where I've gone on about a four hour, four and a half hour straight drive, a five hour drives already in the Nissan. And it, it just makes that experience just a little less um, having not necessarily focus, but just a little bit less pressure on you so you can relax a bit. Obviously, you have to uh, be cognizant of your driving area, your environment, what's going on around you, the weather, the road situation, all that kind of stuff. But they're Fantastic. definitely there to help. Yeah. I would love to test drive more of the electric vehicles and more of the cars that have the different driving aids. I would love to compare. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, because they're all a little bit different. Uh, and so when I talk to a lot of people, uh, yes, I own a, a Nissan, but you know, I, I've driven a lot of the others. So I've had a little bit of experience in driving those. And they are uniquely a bit different uh, depending on how their systems operate. But they, they, they give you similar aspects and similar benefits. So definitely a, a uh, benefit of owning an EV is a lot of this technology that comes with it. And Tesla being unique with the over the air that you mentioned earlier, that the car kind of evolves over time into something better and, and more feature rich as time goes on. That is one of my favorite things about Tesla. Mm -hmm. That's you know what I've been saying, and uh, when when I started the shows even with Trevor a couple of years, way back when, that you know that's part of Tesla's secret sauce is that ability to to change a car, and and other vendors are starting to look at that. You know, Jaguar now with the I Pace, I believe they're going to do over the air uh, updates to try to enhance that. So I think other vendors are getting into that. Mm -hmm. Great. Exactly. Um, uh, you mentioned the the service center and some of the the uh, the, the forms and mechanisms and, and um, things that were available to you during when you were waiting for the Model Three and after you got into it. Have you continued on with some of those? Have you uh, like joined up with a Tesla club and being active in that? Yeah, I think there are so many great ways to connect, whether you prefer forums or hanging out with people in person. Mm -hmm. In the D.C. area, there's an electric vehicle association, evadc.org. Mm -hmm. But really, any region is going to have at least one electric yeah. vehicle club and probably overlapping ones. And then there's also on Facebook, you can join the Tesla Owners Worldwide Club or the Tesla Divas for Women Only. Mm. And then there are also regional Facebook groups for Tesla owners in certain areas to help them meet up at cars and coffee events and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. They're just fantastic resources. And there are a ton that I want to check out even more. I've heard about EV Trip Planner, that that mm. seems like a really interesting way to plan your road trips with slightly more detail than the Tesla Nav. Hmm. Interesting. I'll have to check that one out as well. Now, have you found yourself, obviously, with the Model 3, you're parking or you're, you're out somewhere or you're out at a club. Have you found yourself doing more EV evangelical work, you know, in spreading the adoption goodness that's part of that? Yeah, and it's one of my favorite parts because I'm a natural born teacher, so I love teaching people about things. Only occasionally do you get someone who has deeply rooted opinions and they think they understand and they pose questions in the form of statements. Mm -hmm. But really, even if you talk with those people patiently, they can actually start to open up. And the vast majority of the people I talk to are just so curious and enthusiastic no matter what kind of car they pull up in, mm -hmm. they just want to learn more about these newfangled EVs or Teslas. And, and that's half the battle in EV adoption is, is probably more than half, to be honest with you, is really just knowledge. It's just people not knowing that, you know, that, I, what do you mean? I can drive my electric car through a car wash? Really? Right. <laughs> so can I drive it in the rain? It, you get questions like that and everything in between, you know, as far as range and everything. And it's just it's just getting that, spreading that knowledge. And, uh, you know, we're at a point right now where EVs aren't for everybody. There's not as much selection 
and product out there as there is from an internal combustion vehicle perspective. So it may not fit for every everybody. And, and, and I get it. I think you get it. And anybody who's out talking to people understand that. But where uh, where you can talk to people and provide some level of education, as you're saying, using your, your teaching skills and just give them that knowledge of what's out there, what's available, how these things work and how, how these these technologies can actually fit into your, into somebody's lifestyle. Maybe they're not thinking about it. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if you get asked this, but one of the big, you know, main questions I get asked is range, right? And when you start now, the Model 3 has got the best range on the planet right now from an all electric platform. So it, it's a pretty easy story to, to talk about. Uh, but, you know, you'll still get people going, well, you know, I got to drive up to, uh, to the Cape and I got to drive here and I got to drive all over the place. So that's way more than 300 miles. You know, I can't use an electric. And, and what I ask people is, well, how often do you do those trips? Well, we go two, three times a year. I said, oh, okay, so you're going to buy a car based on a three, right. two or three times a year trip. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. So, mm-hmm. They could just rent a car for those edge cases and right. still have an EV for 95% of their trips. And I really think one of the best ways to spread the knowledge of EVs is just as more people have them, then all their neighbors just get to experience the person owning the car in a very normal way. Right. There's nothing that weird about it. You know, you plug it in just like your smartphone when you yeah. arrive home for most people. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm the exception. Mm-hmm. And they just get to see you month after month, have this very easy, normal car, and yeah. then they suddenly realize, oh, it's just a, a normal car that happens mm-hmm. to be electric. And very quiet as we yes. sne- sneak I up on people. It. No, you're, <laughs> absolutely, you're absolutely right. That That's uh, a great way to to spur on adoption is just through our own experiences and, and neighbors. Now, have you ha- since you've got your Tesla and, and electric car, have you been able to uh, get some of your friends or family that aren't that weren't into electric cars over to that side of the uh, to see the light there and make a decision? Well, this Sunday, I'm going to take my friend on a really fun test drive in the Model 3, and she's deciding between the mid or short range Tesla Model 3 Mm -hmm. and then its different competitors in that Mm -hmm. price point. So Mm -hmm. just giving her a taste of the supercharging and autopilot and what it's like to drive the car because I don't think she's even seen one, let alone sat in one or driven one. Uh-huh. And then she can decide, compare apples to apples with the other cars. But yeah, basically, I just share my experiences with my friends and and on Twitter. And uh-huh. if they have more questions, then I'm happy to answer them. But I try not to be too much in their face about Tesla yeah. all the time, just because I, I do think the Twitter Tesla community is a great outlet for me uh-huh. because then I can talk to all these people who are super into Tesla uh-huh. without overly exhausting all of my closest friends and family. <laughs> no, that's true because sometimes they can get sick of hearing about electric cars uh, because we're so passionate and excited to talk about it and, yeah. and our experiences. So that's great. And that's one of the benefits I find of of and not just myself and, and what I'm hearing from you, but other EV owners that I talk to and have met is they just want to share that excitement uh, and, and spread that knowledge of their of their own use cases. And, you know, be it just by example, uh, you mentioned the clubs before. It's a great avenue where, where clubs do events. Uh, you know, I've done some public events and we go out and people, it's a great place for, for people that don't have EVs to come and ask those questions, see the cars. Sometimes we do uh, drive alongs and we do rides for, for people and that kind of gets their head turning hey, this is just kind of like a regular car. There's really nothing other than that that EV grin you get when you uh, stomp on the accelerator. Yeah, a shout out to the officially sanctioned Tesla Owners Clubs. Mm -hmm. They're all over the place Mm -hmm. in Europe, North America. I think they're pretty broad. And if you Google Tesla Owners Clubs directory, Mm -hmm. then on the Tesla website, there's an email contact for every single official Tesla Owners Clubs, in addition to all of these more EV general clubs and regional clubs that are just for fun. Mm -hmm. So there's a broad range of in-person events, too. And there's more spinning up all the time uh, from what I see because this movement is gaining a lot of traction. Have you seen uh, now, it's it's one of those things where when you get a certain model of a car or you get into a certain type of vehicle, then you all of a sudden notice a lot more on the street. Um, Have you come across that now since your uh, Model 3 ownership? Yes, I have 
very sharply honed Tesla radar. I can spot, you know, an eighth of a Model S like two blocks down going through a light. I just, I think it's because every time I saw a Tesla, I got this endorphin rush in my brain. Mm -hmm. And that's how the brain best learns things is getting really excited about something. Now I can't not see them. And DC is also another hotspot for Teslas. There are so many here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So and remember that, folks, uh, endorphins is what you need for uh, I need to pass calculus, right? <laughs> On top of Alexi's help for that, for sure. Well, that's awesome. I mean, a couple of things I wanted to talk about, um, uh, you know, of course, in sharing your story and get your viewpoints on a couple of news articles uh, that have come out recently. Uh, I'm just reading an article about California that they've, they've passed or they're about to surpass 500,000 plug-in electric car sales since wow. they started selling into that state, I believe back in 2010 or around that time frame when they were uh, uh, starting to track these numbers. And, you know, we know California is the first CARB state. Uh, it's the it's the first ZEV state as well uh, that they've come out with. So there's a lot of momentum. Uh, but that's just an astounding number when you look at, I just reported on one of my last shows that it, it, the U.S. itself just passed the million dollars, the million plug-in vehicle car adoptions. Um, what, so how do you feel about that? Are you excited to, to see those kind of numbers and to see that kind of uptake? I'm so excited because the more we can see EVs working out on a grand scale in regional areas, the more other governors and mayors are going to support their own local areas, whether it's supporting Tesla sales or supporting charging infrastructure. Because we had Norway always as this massive Mm -hmm. outlier percentage-wise for EVs because of the government helping them out. And now to have our own version of Norway within the U.S. Mm -hmm. and to be able to see how it can work under U.S. governance can help out other U.S. states get more excited about passing legislation that helps them out, too. And, you know, even with all the excitement last Tuesday, uh, this past Tuesday that you guys had, especially at the epicenter being in D.C. where you are, um, now that the dust has settled from that, I, I really don't see from a high level this whole industry kind of slowing down in the U.S. specifically. It's just it's kind of got so much momentum that. There's just too much going on to to see that. Are you do you get the same sense? Uh, being that you're you you live in the U.S., you're U.S. You know, what's your thoughts about that? Exactly. I think we're past the tipping point at this mm-hmm. point, and we're still around. I think it's one to two percent elect, electric vehicle sales, so it's not super large. But when you go to certain areas like D.C. or San Francisco, and you see a massive number of EVs. And then you have that nonlinear effect of everyone's neighbors getting to know EVs and how normal and easy they are, Mm -hmm. then it really spreads exponentially. And then other municipalities can get used to it. But I really think we're past the tipping point where EVs are pretty normal to own and you don't have to be willing to completely change your lifestyle to own one. And there's such a variety. So if you like a certain brand of car, a lot of brands now have their own version of an EV, so you can stay in your favorite brand. And there's all different ranges in luxury and range. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's an EV for a larger and larger portion of the market at this point. Mm-hmm. And definitely more coming, you know, with all the announcements and all the yeah. most of the manufacturers getting into the to the program. Now there, you know, to segue on what you just said as well, uh, there's another article that I was just reading about, you know, Big Auto, about some of the companies kind of evolving too slowly um, or, you know, uh, trying to cannibalize other parts of their business to get into the EV game. And I think, yeah. the, you know, we're, we're looking at kind of the big three in the U.S., uh, GM, Ford and Chrysler, who who have had, you know, some uh, some obviously dipping their toes into the EV waters. Uh, you know, the, the the Volt has been a very good car for GM. The the Volt yes. or the B is is doing well. Um, you know, Ford products have been limited in, in in a lot of cases. The people that that have them love them, but they've just you know they haven't got to the range scale yet that you talked about. Um, kind of what's being level set now. And Chrysler has kind of missed the boat on that too. They're they're still kind of struggling more with hybrids and more with some plug-in vehicles. I think they're, uh, you know, the Pacific has a great vehicle for for those uh, use yeah. cases where you're, you know, a mom's got some kids or whatever, a family's, you know, using it for 20, 30 miles a day. 
doing errands and running the school and, and pra soccer practice and all this kind of stuff. It's a great alternative where you can drive on battery only and Mitsu with the Outlander as well. Um, so what's your take on that? Are you, are you, are you seeing, you know, when you talk to people, are you seeing them, you know, I'm a Ford guy and I'm always going to be a Ford guy. You're starting to see some of these mindsets change. I do think so. And I'm really glad to see so many options because some people will take maybe one generation of EV ownership to mm -hmm. then be a little more broad minded in which brand that they buy. But when I, I'm really excited about cars like the GM Bolt with a B, mm -hmm. I think it has great specs and it hits a great large segment of the market. And I see more of them around DC these days. Mm -hmm. I do think that the next step for GM would be to get more serious about the production of the Bolt, mm -hmm. the marketing of the Bolt, and to get to the point where they're not losing money on every sale and making up for it with pickup trucks. It should be a self-sustaining part of the business so that if there's a major shift in the market towards EVs, GM isn't in trouble. That's a great point you make from a financial. I mean, uh, and I've talked about this on previous shows that, we, you know, the big dealers are making, you know, there's, there's big profit margins on SUVs and pickup trucks and some of those kind of class vehicles. And they, they aren't making much money on EVs. In fact, most of them, the, the non-Teslas of the world and, and Nissan's probably not in that that loop because they've been uh, building the leaf for quite some time but most of the others tend to even lose money on these cars so they're not you know other than the zev credits and and some of those you know mandates to to build electric for for those reasons they're not motivated and i think you make a great point is that you know they need to start getting with the program and realizing that this is a really a market that that's only at two percent saturation so there's a huge uptake uh, in where uh, electric vehicles can can go from a market penetration and get with that program and, and start you know getting those economies of scale and especially companies like GM, Ford, and Chrysler that have such a such a large infrastructure and ability to scale much quicker than somebody like a Tesla. And right now they have the luxury, maybe it's declining a little bit with new car sales going down in the U.S., but right now they have a pretty healthy uh, profit margin on the SUVs, the trucks, the market likes the SUVs and trucks. They should use this time with all that money coming in to help with the R&D to bring down the production costs and the other cars that a decade from now might be the majority of their sales. Totally agree with you. So if anybody from GM, Ford, or Chrysler, <laughs> or some of the others are listening, please, uh, you know, take maybe take a little bit of our advice and uh, uh, what we're saying here to heart and maybe uh, try to affect some change a little bit quicker in those organizations. You know, they talk about it, but it's all it's all about actions as well, not just not just talk, because they certainly have the abilities to, to start cranking out EVs at a much broader scale. And we've seen actually the European and the Asian manufacturers jump to that, where, you know, Mercedes and Audi are getting into the game with luxury SUVs, because obviously that's where the profits are, the, the margins, and they're going to start there to help fund their programs. Um, you know, the, the uh, Hyundai Kia, with, I think the, the Kona and the, the Nero are going to be just knock your socks off EVs. I really think that that's another tipping point within the EV industry that these smaller, uh, small to mid-sized crossover SUV vehicles uh, that still have an affordability aspect with a with a, a big bunch of range, you know, and a very solid, uh, solid, solid, uh, feature-rich vehicle. I think they're gonna they're gonna do a, a big switch to the uh, uh, EV marketplace and an impact there. I can't wait. Uh, people really want a lot of cargo space and they want mm -hmm. to be higher off the road. That's what mm -hmm. the sales figures say. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's great that you can have an electric vehicle below the price point of the Model X filling that massive gap in EVs right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked with you before the show started about the Jaguar I-Pace and it's great that Jaguar is doing something, but they're a niche player and they, you know, they'll build 15 to 20,000 for their type of market that they service. And that's great. You know, it's great that they're getting into that with a, with a decent product. But in order to really get to that mass market, you know, and I talked about this, I believe, on my last soapbox show that I call it. If you, if you had to listen to that, I got a lot of comments about that. Very positive comments, I should add, for most of them. But, you know, we do need to get that price down to get penetration into more of the mass market with with a choice as you're saying people want these type of cars and maybe don't need a big escalator or, or a Yukon or a Denali but they need something 
less than that, but maybe not as small as a Honda Civic for their needs. So there's a good mid place. And uh, I think the Koreans have picked up on that. And hopefully Honda and Toyota, which again, I'm disappointed that they're slow out of the gate. You know, they've been kind of focusing on other areas and hydrogen and things, which I, you know, won't, I don't think will work in the mass market. What's your take about that? Have you seen any, any uh, hydrogen stuff going on in DC? I haven't. I haven't really been looking for it, so it might be around. Uh, I was really impressed with Honda to have the insight so early before it was cool. And I want to see Honda get back into the game with a more serious EV. Uh, the I think it was the Honda Clarity EV yeah. has yeah. specs that just aren't palatable to almost any consumer. So the right. plug-in version is okay, but the all-electric Mm -hmm. it's not going to sell. Um, so anyway, to see Honda get back seriously in the game would be fantastic because there are so many people used to the brand name Honda. And yeah, I'm not familiar with the hydrogen uh, progress around here, but I'd be curious. Yeah, it's probably not that much. And where I've seen uh, more hydrogen use cases in the commercial side where it makes sense, you know, for fleets and these kind of things that have specific routes or duties, you know, uh, it makes sense because the infrastructure to support that is very expensive and, and it's it's a unique infrastructure. It's tough to build those on every corner like you like you do with a, a normal, you know, petrol fuel station today or even charging elements which are starting to get you know these uh, these BPs and shells and, and so forth of the worlds are starting to see the light to say hey let's put a charger a couple of chargers yeah. in our gas station so Petro Canada is starting to roll them out up here. Yeah I think it's such a smart idea for big gas station chains to start integrating charging and it's just such a natural transition yes. because they make most of their profits on their convenience store sales mm -hmm. so that they don't mind that they're not buying gasoline. I, I really have That's enjoyed right. my experiences at the superchargers at Wawa's and Sheep. Mm. Excellent. Good. And that's, that's a great point that you make that they are looking to put these chargers into stations that have some sort of an amenity, you know, basically, a, you know, coffee shop or something like that, uh, or a food stand or something that you can sit for half an hour while you're charging and, and spend some money with them. And these are at higher Absolutely. margin. <laughs> higher margin solutions than just the gas is exactly well listen this has been very entertaining and very knowledgeable anything you want to add from a closing perspective on your your overall experiences about owning an ev especially you know owning a tesla but owning an ev in the city what what, what do you want to leave viewers uh, listeners with there is such a flexibility and range of solutions. You can make something work with PlugShare. There are chargers, public chargers downtown in your city. Just go f find them. And then you can also talk to your building about installing a fancier charger, especially with some of those tax incentives. The superintendent might not have to pay anything. And you have people like my Tesla neighbor that just use a 110 outlet for city commuting, that can be super effective. And supercharging is really fast. And a lot of the other public high speed charging is coming. So mm -hmm. if you haven't tried an EV, just go try some test drives and bother your neighbor down the road that has <laughs> one and get to know it a little more because it's surprisingly easy and natural. It's not a big lifestyle change for most people. Exactly. And just, you know, on that charging note, you, you jogged my memory is that from a Tesla perspective, you're not just limited to superchargers. You can use other level two chargers uh, with the with the J1772 adapter, I believe that, that you can get quite easily. And I keep tweeting Elon now. I'm just going to keep bugging him once a week until I get an answer on this Model 3 Chatamo adapter, because I have a oh. lot of a lot of people that uh, text me and email me about that. When's that coming out? Because I know in, in, in some specific areas, CCS and Chatamo is, is becoming quite quite large from a uh, just as large as supercharging is from uh, from a deployment so it'd be nice to give tesla owners the ability to to utilize those services uh, uh ccs won't be coming anytime soon but chatamo is there and they just got to get it working with the model 3 you haven't heard anything on that have you i have not but it should be really soon since it's working fine with model <laughs> s and model x and the charging port looks the same on the model 3 yeah, you would hope so. So I'll keep uh, I'll keep tweeting Elon until I get an answer or until it just shows up. But uh, I've been doing that on a more regular basis. But hopefully that'll come. Well, listen, it's been a joy to have you on the show. I really appreciate. It. Now, how can listeners uh, find you and uh, and follow you uh, on what uh, what mediums are you on? 
If you type into Google owning a Tesla in the city, you'll find my Twitter account. Uh -huh. And or if you type into Twitter owning a Tesla in the city. And I love answering people's specific questions and just uh, encouraging all of this positive discourse on Twitter with the Tesla community. I have learned so much from everybody in the Tesla niche there. And it's just so much fun. And the EV niche as a broader area on Twitter. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Twitter is a great tool for that. And, uh, you know, and Facebook and all the other mechanisms that you mentioned that there's so much resources out there. Um, and it's just great to help people to spur that EV adoption. So I want to thank you again for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join me on, uh, on taping this, this podcast. And I'd love to hear of your response as well. Let us know uh, what you thought of this show. Um, you can email me at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. Uh, always welcome feedback. And uh, if you're looking for a show topic, let me know. Of course, I'm on Twitter as well with, uh, as uh, Alexi is. I'm at, at EV Rev Show is my Twitter handle. If you're not following me on YouTube, please just Google EV Revolution Show and all the stuff will, will pop up. And uh, for those that are interested in supporting me on Patreon, you can check out uh, www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show. Check out my page. And if you're interested, even a dollar a month uh, will help go a long way in helping me to produce this fine, hopefully quality uh, entertainment that we've provided here today with uh, my lovely guest, Alexi. So thank you very much again for joining me. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ken. I really enjoyed Lucky Episode 7. That's right. It is a lucky episode. And let's keep in touch. And when you do come up to the GTA area, when you guys come up, let me know. I'd love to meet up with you and have a chat, see how things are going. I can't wait. There are superchargers all the way there. Excellent. And we'll probably, uh, I'll probably reach out to you in the future to get you back on a show one of these days Perfect. if you're, if you're, if you're up wait. for that. So much fun. Excellent. Well, thank you very much again, and thank you to my listeners, and I uh, want to wish everybody all the best, and take care out there. Well, until next time. Bye. This episode of the EV Revolution Show is sponsored by File Sanctuary. Need a great web host for your business? Need to get email at yourdomain.com? They provide professional, feature-rich web and email hosting for any project you have in mind. Get started today at filesanctuary.net forward slash cloud and save 10% with promo code EVREVSHOW. Mm -hmm.